other people to help them, to help their competence and their competence. Look at two C's. Pretend like that this C up on top is confidence. And this down here, this C is competence. As a leader, we have to be sure that whether we are leading at home in the community or at work, that we are building both. Because when people have more self-confidence, they're more willing to learn. When they have more competence, when they learn, they feel better about themselves. And it goes around and around and around. All of the children that we're working with at America's Promise, 15 million children at risk across the country, when we find these children, we see that one of those is missing. They may be smart, but they have no confidence. Or they may be, have the confidence, but they don't know how to do it. And then the spiral goes this way. Well, it is the same for all of us and for the people that you affect as a leader. So we want to be sure that you're a cheerleader. Make people feel good about themselves and talk about what it is they do well and help them learn what they need to learn. As you can imagine, my career keeps me on the road a lot. I travel a lot. And I have a wonderful housekeeper. Her name is Bertha, and I don't know what I would possibly do without her. And the routine is usually this. I'm usually on the road on a Tuesday night. I will call her home, talk to her about what she's going to do on Wednesdays, because she comes on Wednesdays to, to clean house. Well, what happened was, one Wednesday, I wasn't on the road. I was home, and Bill and I had a meeting uh, off with a client, but we were there when she arrived. And so when she came in, we talked, and I said, Bertha, we're having a, a dinner party Saturday night, and if you could do a little extra here, a little extra there, we'd sure appreciate it. She is so great. She says, well, who's coming, and what are you going to wear, and what's on the menu? And she was just wonderful. We love her. So we went off to our meeting. And we came home that night, and the house was absolutely incredible, sparkling. And we said, she's fabulous. And I went right out to my desk, and I got a little note card. And I wrote, and I said, dear Bertha, you are so fabulous. We love you. And then I listed the things that she did particularly well. And at the bottom I put, don't you dare ever leave us. I don't know what we do without you. Love, Mr. and Mrs. Bethel. And I sent it. I didn't think anything more of it. The next Tuesday, I'm on the road, and I call her house, and her son answers. And I said, can I talk to your mom? And he said, well, she's not here right now. She went shopping. Can you call back in a couple minutes? I said, sure, not a problem. And he says, but wait, Miss Bethel, before you hang up, I want to tell you something. He said, my mother has been cleaning other people's houses for 25 years. She's put three of us through college. And in all those years, she's never received a thank you note like you sent. And my heart went from here to here, and I said, I'll call back. <laughs> and he said, wait, before you hang up, I want to tell you something. We were so proud of her that, Miss Bethel, I took that little note, and I got a pretty little frame. And I framed it, and we hung it in the living room. And my heart was right up here, and I said, I'm going to hang up now. <laughs> you see, Thoreau wrote that people lead lives of quiet desperation. And the problem is, you see, we don't always know what's going on in the hearts of people. We don't know what burdens they carry or what sorrows they have or what difficulties they're having. People put on a good face. They come to work. They try to do their best. They smile. We don't really know. We can't tell by the exterior of what's going on inside of people. And wouldn't it be magnificent for you as a leader to be able to praise someone honestly for something well done and make them feel good about themselves because you never know the person that needs that so much that day, that place, that time. So I have another challenge for you. You know I'm full of challenges, as you can guess by now. Here's another challenge for you. Say to yourself, who can I praise tonight? Can you call someone? Can you write a note? Tomorrow morning, can you call? Can you leave a voicemail? Who can I praise? Because I truly believe that the leader thinks in the morning several things, says, what's my message? What do I stand for? And who can I uplift and be a cheerleader to today? Because that's my job as a leader, fostering. The other thing that we have to foster is perspective. Boy, it's hard to keep it in perspective sometimes. Anybody here read The Tale of Two Cities? Do you remember? First page, first paragraph, 
first line, it said, that's right, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. It was that way a hundred years ago when the book was written, it's that way now, and it'll be that way a hundred years from now. There's always the good, the bad, the yin and the yang, always happening at the same time. So to keep things in perspective is so critically important. And one of the skills that I write about and that I talk about all the time, sometimes people don't put in leadership courses or in leadership books, and it's called having a sense of humor, developing a sense of humor, keeping your antenna up, because a leader who can walk into a situation that might be stressful or, or troublesome or just overly heavy, if you can walk in as a leader and use a sense of humor to lighten everybody's load, give everybody a 30-second mental vacation and send them on their way, using that wonderful perspective, being able to keep it, keep it in perspective, to be able to laugh at yourself and the situation. Two and a half years ago, my husband had a heart attack and ended up, had surgery, he had, they did the rotor rooter you know, and they did the angioplast, and then they put two stints in his arteries, and he's fine. He's just perfectly healthy, but it was pretty scary. And I sat there, and, and when he came out of surgery, the doctor came out, and he said, you know, Bill, you got to walk more. Now, we walk a lot anyway, but we listen to him, and he said, you know, you don't have to go to the gym or any of that stuff, and you don't have to buy all of that special stuff you wear. Just get a good pair of shoes and keep on walking every day, 30 minutes a day. And I thought about it, and I thought about this ability to lighten the load, and because Bill and I were pretty worried. And I looked at the doctor. I said, doctor, it is wonderful. You mean we don't have to buy spandex? And he said, no, why? I said, lift the blanket up, pick my husband's leg up, and I said, look at this. This is the skinniest leg you've ever seen. You put spandex on my husband, and it wrinkles. We laughed, and I tried so hard to bring the laughter into it, because laughter's healing. Foster perspective, keeping it in perspective. Young girl was in college, and she wanted to have her parents keep some things in perspective, and she wrote a little note, and she said to them, Dear Mom and Dad, I'm sorry that I've not written to you for so long, but all my stationery was lost the night the dormitory was burned down by the demonstrators. I'm out of the hospital now. The doctor says my eyesight should return to normal sooner or later. <laughs> the wonderful boy Bill who rescued me from the fire kindly offered to share his apartment with me until I found a new place to live. You always wanted a grandchild. <laughs> So you'll be glad to know that you'll be grandparents next month. Love, Mary. <laughs> P.S. Please disregard the above exercise in creative writing. There hasn't been any fire. I haven't been in the hospital. I'm not pregnant. In fact, I don't even have a boyfriend. But I did get a D in French and an F in mathematics. And I wanted to be sure that you receive this news in its proper perspective. <laughs> Fostering humor is a wonderful, it's a God-given gift to be able to laugh. What is the last one? What is the fourth one? It's called family. That's not new to you, not this group. But I'd be remiss if I didn't say a few words about it. You see, I know the bottom line of business is to make money, certainly. Keep people employed, keep a lifestyle that is, in this country, second to none. But the bottom line of life, the real bottom line, is those that we love and those that love us. And at your ability, you see, in this business that you're in, you help people. You help families. You help people so that their lives are easier and so that they can enjoy time together more without worry of consequences. And so when we look at that, we want to say, am I able to keep my personal life in balance and my business life in balance? Because my example counts. But I want to tell you something. I want to take you off the hook so you don't think that there's something heavy here. There's no such thing as perfect balance between our business life and our personal life. It does not exist. But the best thing that we can do for ourselves and those we love is just think about it. Keep it in our mind every single day. Do little things that matter. You see, I've never known anyone who laid on their deathbed and said, Oh, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. You see, in my family, I have one sister. My mother and father wanted a son. No such luck. I was born. I was appointed boy of the family. 
my dad loved me and I loved him, but in those days, dads were kind of straight-laced and they weren't allowed to hug and kiss as we can now. And, and my mother and I got along great, but my dad and I had a special relationship. I was the boy. And I got married very young, right out of high school, had Mike before I was 19, had my other son Shannon before I was 21, went off and started my family. Seven years after I'd been married, my father retired and moved out to the country in a little, a nice little house with my mother to enjoy his retirement. Early on, very early on in his retirement, he called me one day on the telephone and in a very emotional voice, he said, Sheila, he said, will you please meet me for lunch today? I need to talk. And I said, sure, Dad, I will. And I met my dad for lunch. And I sat there for three and a half hours across the luncheon table from my dad. And I listened to him talk about his regrets over the commitments that he didn't keep to himself. He said, you know, after, after the depression, he said, I want to go back to school and finish getting my degree. And he said, I could have done that. He says, but I don't know what happened. I didn't. And I promised your mother that I would buy her some things and take her some places, but those commitments didn't seem to happen much either. And he said, how did you and your sister grow up so fast? It was like sand that slipped through my fingers. And he said, I wanted to take you some places and talk to you about so many, many things. And he says, and now it's too late because you're grown up and so is she. And he said, Sheila, he said, it's too late. He said, because this morning, the doctor tells me I have six months left to live. And then he looked across the table and he asked me the most terrible question. He said, sweetheart, what am I going to do now? And I said, I don't know, daddy. Because what he'd done is he'd come out the road of life. He was standing at the end looking back, filled with regret over the business and personal commitments that he didn't keep to himself. And almost six months to the day, he did pass away. And when he did, I thought about all those things that he had told me that day. And he left me a legacy that day because he told me three things that changed my life from then, from now on, and on to when I'm gone. I passed it to my children. And let me share with you. He said, Sheila, when it comes to your commitments, he said, don't put them off. Do it now. Do it. And I thought about that every day. Seven years passed. I was a single mother raising my two teenage boys. I was in sales and marketing, and I'd gotten a bonus check for something that I'd done well. I thought about what my dad said, and I put a little bit in the bank, and I took the rest, and I went into a travel agency, and I bought three airplane tickets. It was in the middle of the winter, and I went home, and I asked two teenage boys who are snow skiing fanatics the dumbest question possible. I said, who'd like to take off school for a week, go skiing? Is that a dumb question? <laughs> Saturday afternoon, we went out to San Francisco International Airport. We got on that airplane. We went up the West Coast to Calgary, Canada. We got off of that airplane. They picked us up on a bus. They drove us and deposited us at the Banff Springs Hotel. And if you've never seen it, it's like a little castle right in the middle of the mountains. And my two sons and I skied for five full days, just the three of us, and we had an incredible time. And the last day that we were there, we got up very early. We went out to the ski area, and we got up on the chairlift and the gondola, and we went up and 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 up. And at 9 o'clock in the morning, we were the first and only three human beings standing at the top of a 9,000-foot mountain. We were above the clouds. And when we looked down below, we could not see the valley floor because there were the clouds. And stretched out in front of us was the Continental Divide, the Canadian Rocky Mountains, covered with snow in a crystal clear blue sky. So incredibly beautiful. I went up to the boys. I said, wait a minute, guys. Can I go first? And they said, hit it, Mom. So old Mom went over to this first ledge, and I got tucked under, and I came off that first ledge, and I skied down that icy face, not to the valley floor, just the bottom of that first face. And as I got down to the bottom, I turned around, and I looked back up, and here was this huge white face of a mountain, like every postcard and, 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 and poster that you've ever seen for a beautiful white mountain, and standing all the way up at the top was the pride and the joy of my life. And my commitment was my two sons. 
and I took my ski pole and I signaled. I said, come on, Mike, come on, Shannon. And I watched my two Irishmen come down the face of that mountain making figure eights crisscrossing. And the only sound that you could hear as they got near me were their skis cutting through that light powdery snow and it would go whoosh, whoosh. And that light snow would come up in the air and hang just for a second like lace. And when they were standing down in front of me, I knew it made a difference to them. It made a great difference to me. And I knew my dad was up there looking down, and I knew it made a difference what he said to me. And I looked up and I said, that one was for you, Dad. Ladies and gentlemen, you make a difference in the lives of more people than you can even imagine. Your family, your friends, people in the industry. Each one of you, as a leader, can make a difference. But as my dad said when he talked about commitment, he said, don't put it off. Do it now. Do it. Thank you. God bless. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.